So for this particular session, we're focusing on doing away with debt um, and revisiting development finance. Almost half of African countries are at risk of debt distress. Multiple macroeconomic shocks have laid bare the continent's vulnerabilities. And now we really need to think about the existing financial architecture and developments for uh, financing for developments and proposed alternatives. We know that it's not working. In August 2021, there was a release of $650 billion of special drawing rights um, in response to the pandemic. Only 5% of that, $33 billion, um, reached African countries. And so we really need to have a fairer process um, around how these resources are allocated. And we need to rethink it so that we focus on the needs um, and not simply on the positions, the current positions uh, that countries may have at the IMF. And in spite of the unequal distribution of special drawing rights among member countries, there's a 2022 report on how countries made use of these SDRs. And it shows that Sub-Saharan Africa is the region that has made the most efficient use of the SDRs. They've been used to procure vaccines, um, provide other pandemic relief interventions, such as ration cards, welfare payments, and wages, as well as budget support. We also know that at the sixth European Union summit in February last year, participants agreed to call for an ambitious reallocation of, um, to, pull to put together a pool of 100 billion US dollars uh, to make available uh, for African countries. But now, more than a year later, these commitments are yet to fully ma materialize. And so we find ourselves in a challenging situation. But we are joined here by this uh, group of esteemed panelists. Um, you heard when they were introduced, they represent a broad range of experience and expertise. Um, and just to help us think through what are the alternative uh, mechanisms uh, that we could put in place uh, and the specific actions that need to be taken place. So let me start with you, um, Rajiv. Given the recent economic crisis in Sri Lanka, and in light of the pressing issue of debt distress and vulnerability facing many African countries, how would you assess the role of the major financial institutions in responding to such crises in low and middle income countries? And do you see any specific reforms that are needed? Thank you for that question. Um, the multilateral agencies have a vital role in, in, in this present uh, dynamic. But in the case of Sri Lanka, one cannot blame the multilateral agencies in that way because it was actually uh, a delay on the part of our leadership at the time to reach out to the multilateral agencies. And um, there was a thinking that a homegrown solution was in place, which was not the case. Uh, so from that point, standpoint, uh, from Sri Lanka's point of view, uh, there is no blame cast upon the multilateral agencies for what happened. Uh, for example, take Bangladesh, when they had a problem which they foresaw, foresaw they went, went to the IMF and then and, 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 and corrected the position. Uh, so the learning from the Sri Lankan experience vis-a-vis -vis the multilateral agencies is that one needs to reach out. We are in a stressed and stretched time. Uh, one cannot, there is no room for experimenting. So if you have a problem, if you have a crisis which you foresee, you must reach out, and, and uh, commercial debt is not an alternative uh, because you get into more trouble. Uh, in, respect, in response to your question on reform, uh, we have, of course, debt and we have alternate debt. Um, there are a lot of nice, pro uh, nice uh, alternate debt schemes in place uh, from foreign investment to public-private partnership, but we must all look at, the, look at as to why we are not reaching the full potential of alternate debt, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's Africa. What are those reasons? What about accountability? What about transparency? What about consistency of public policy? policy? Uh, ease of doing business? A lot of those are, the, those are the reasons why investors are circumspect to come to our countries. And if we are looking at alternate debt seriously, we need to get that side of it sorted out. Another aspect I would like to briefly touch, touch upon is uh, the diaspora funding. All of our country, we have nationals outside who are willing and happy to to, to support, but they are concerned as to 
whether the funds will be properly used. So, you know, this type of forum also is a place where we can discuss the need for maybe agencies, whether it's worldwide, world agencies, whether it's national agencies, to look at uh, how diaspora funding could be made use of and objectively made use of so that the, the, the diaspora does not lose out. Uh, briefly on, on debt, since we, we, have, we have gone through this, this crisis, the, we had a lot of projects where we had taken debt for, for uh, uh, projects which didn't reap those benefits. And um, of course, one, one easy way out is to, to offload those to the private sector and ask the private sector to look at the infrastructure. If that is not an option, then one needs to look at uh, having the borrowers and the lenders um, to be responsible. Because what we saw is that some of these projects, the proper evaluations were not done. And had those been done, the project that the project would not have been been taken on. So the, as much as the borrower, the lender also has a responsibility. And I think, in, given what has taken place, whilst one can't go back in time, looking to the future, I think there's a need worldwide to look at a different ecosystem where the the lender is also held responsible. If it is reckless lending, whoever that may be, then if you get into default, you get in trouble. Then you must take part of that responsibility. And maybe conventions, maybe best practices. The, the law doesn't permit it as of now because you're stuck with an agreement. But if we can build those into the ecosystem, maybe going forward, the courts also will look at it differently. And I, I've seen that the courts are looking at it, making observations in that, in that light. So, so that is something we need to look at. And, and there's a humanitarian aspect also. When a nation lends to another nation, apart from lending to the, 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 the ruling person at the time of the ruling party, you are leading to its people. So you have, so all of those concepts are caught up in the Sustainable Development Goals, in the UN uh, General Assembly um, uh, resolutions. So all of that now we must try to relate to debt financing as well. So. Thank you. Let me now turn to Gwen. As the Managing Director of Ecobank in Cameroon, you have first-hand experience in the financial sector. How do you believe African banks, including Ecobank, can contribute to the development and implementation of alternative financing systems that address the challenges that are faced by African countries as well as its citizens? Thank you for that question. Um, the first thing is to just to set the stage when we talk about um, financing in Africa and particularly in the area where I operate in the SEMA country, Central Africa, we must realize that we're still doing plain vanilla banking. So nothing fancy is going on there. We do the normal lending and we focus on small and medium sized enterprises and on corporate names and retail business. But increasingly we realize that um, sometimes the request or the needs of our communities, of the business owners that operate in our, in our circles are different from those in countries out of the scope of Africa. So if you look at Ecobank, we, are, we have the mission to finance the economies in which we operate and we give alternatives such as um, microfinancing. We have a microfinance um, because we realize we cannot always just focus on the high net worth or the SME. So we have microfinance where you have agents that go out and collect funds from the unbanked. We have um, small lending um, facilities that we give to micro business owners. We equally have a program that is focused on women called Elevate. So we have a program that gives um, special conditions to women, be it in account maintenance fees or the type of financing we give them because their needs are different from everyone else. We also have um, product programs that we put in place for small and medium sized enterprises because some of the small and medium sized enterprises are simply supplying goods or services to multinational companies. So they need just little funds to be able to source their goods before they can make the delivery. And we have been working a lot with fintechs because you have to also look at um, new entrepreneurs that are coming in. They don't have a history that you can use to evaluate what will be their risk, how much you can give them. So we have to partner with fintechs 
who are interested in that space and who can partner with us to be able to finance those um, upcoming entrepreneurs. And we equally work a lot with the telcos to give micro loans. Sometimes in our communities, somebody just needs $5 to get by. So we have a program with um, MTN in particular where we can give just those micro loans that people need to be able to um, just carry out a basic need, just buy a little good, um, just be able to do what they can to get some money during the day. So um, I also believe that at the government level, because we don't only provide solutions to um, the business sector, if you look at what we have been doing with governments in the past, governments were um, leveraging on direct loans to be able to finance projects, which was the wrong way to do things because they, already, they were already highly leveraged with engagements with DFIs and, and what have you. So we try to move them to what should be the right way of financing, which is by issuing of government bonds or government securities, treasury bills, and increasingly you would see that the portfolio of banks, um, portfolio of banks, commercial banks in the Central African and even West African zone is now focused on government bonds, government security, so that governments have the long-term money they need to be able to um, carry out projects and at the same time we have been able to activate the secondary market because it's not only the banks who should buy the government bonds and government securities we should be able to get the population to invest in those bonds so that the money goes down into the secondary market it gives another source of investments for those who have the means but at the same time it's increasing the basket of funds that the government has to be able to do projects so at ecobank those are the different types of initiatives that we are trying to do to support um, the communities in which we operate. Great. Thank you, Gwen. So, Nagesh, you spent much of your career looking at macroeconomic policy and financing for development. Can you share some case studies or examples of innovative sources of financing which could be considered for development financing in LMICs? Thank you uh, for this question. Actually, uh, in this discussion on development finance, and because we need a staggering amounts of uh, the uh, development finance, which is affordable, which is cheap, not uh, based on LIBOR++ plus plus rates, there are many uh, solutions or new and innovative finance mechanisms are coming uh, and surfacing mm -hmm. on the table. The, uh, discussions about uh, the airport, uh, sorry, air, air ticket levies, uh, the taxes on uh, billionaires. There is an article in Economist today, this morning, uh, which uh, uh, talks about it by Jayati Ghosh. But one idea which has been on the table for some time and has not been somehow receiving the due amount of uh, recognition is the International Financial Transactions Tax, IFTT. Uh, this was uh, uh, proposed by Bill Gates uh, to the 2009 uh, G20 summit, and then it was on the agenda. Uh, but in 2011, uh, the, despite the uh, you know, support, uh, big support by European leaders, including President Sarkozy at the Cannes summit, it failed to get adopted because of, you know, uh, lack of consensus. One or two countries were not in support of it. But this has been hanging around, and I think it is uh, time that it is given a new uh, sort of uh, uh, reconsideration because of the fact that uh, the budgets in developed and developing countries are overstretched. They can't, uh, you know, allow a major expansion of development finance. As we have seen that uh, GNI 0.7% uh, target hasn't been met for, over the past 50 years. The $100 billion target has not been met uh, since 2009. So this is one uh, you know, uh, potential source of new uh, revenue, perpetual revenue, hurting no one. So a very small, uh, you know, 0.05%, uh, uh, sorry, 0.05% uh, kind of a very marginal tax 
could yield $650 billion of revenue every year, hurting no one. So this is, uh, I think, uh, something which we need to consider. And, uh, and I hope the G20 leaders this time around, uh, you know, uh, begin to work on it and uh, put it on back on the agenda. And this would be, uh, you know, going long way to help solve the resources problem. Thank you. Thank you, Nagesh. Um, Let me turn to Tetsushi. You have done quite a bit of work on the impact of multiple crises, including COVID-19, on micro, small, and medium enterprises. What do you see as the unique financing needs of this group? And what can you say about their potential impacts on a country's development trajectory? Thank you, Rachel. So you have moved from macro story to micro. Uh, yes, I have conducted uh, lots of uh, microeconomic studies of micro, small and medium enterprises. And, uh, it's uh, kind of dangerous to ask me uh, the question about uh, that sector because I cannot stop. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what uh, uh, clock? So this sector is unique uh, because it's extremely diverse. So during the COVID-19, the government needed, many government needed to provide them kind of cash transfer for the, because they are important people and they themselves are good citizens and they, they uh, offer jobs to the young people who, many of whom, uh, you know, unfortunately uh, couldn't continue the education. That's why they are working from the relatively early age and also uh, some of them, some of micro and small ent enterprises may become, uh, may have a, a great potential to grow very large uh, dynamically. So to support the industrial development uh, in the future. So uh, the, you know, helping them uh, survive was very important. But now it's time to talk about the recovery of the businesses. And then this is uh, actually a risky uh, period because they see all oh, demand is coming back and the materials are becoming available. So let's start restart business or expand our business. And then government uh, tend to be still continue to be you know conducive to their you know and business. So uh, they may be able to borrow some money or to buy a machine or to uh, buy the more expensive materials, uh, then they fail. <laughs> Many of them fail because they do not know the proper way of management. Okay. And then especially micro enterprises owners may not keep any record. So they have no idea they are making money today or losing money. So, so that's people uh, uh, can, should not have uh, you know, big amount of money, right? But so it's uh, very dangerous. So that's why uh, it's very important uh, for them uh, to have some nice partner, or nice lender. So that tend to be, as Graham said, a micro uh, finance or micro credit credit providers. So they come uh, regularly and frequently to monitor the businesses. And also, they can provide training or business, uh, you know, practices. Uh, so that will be very important. That's a unique nature of the finance in this sector. And, but uh, uh, overall, the sector, because sector is so diverse, so the policymakers have very different image of this sector. Some people think, oh, this uh, MSME sector is, cannot uh, be a uh, uh, important pillar of the economy. So th they are kind of draw, uh, but uh, other policy makers have very different view that, oh, these sectors could be the, uh, you know, source of the future, you know, leading industries and industrialists. So that's why they cannot have a, a good policy that satisfy everyone. And it's impossible to satisfy every, all the uh, MSMEs. So this uh, MSME policies are usually uh, all failures in, uh, across the world. So the policymakers should uh, know which is good, which is bad. 
And then in order to distinguish a good one, a potential one, and a no potential one, yeah, starting point would be to provide some kind of business training. Then good one quickly run and start growing so you can easily. But without that kind of uh, training, it's very difficult to distinguish potential one and the non-potential one. So. Thank you. And so, Campeta, thank you for being patient. Um, what is the role, the unique role, that in-country development banks such as BRD play in sourcing and deploying financing for developments? And how do you position yourself vis-a-vis -vis the Bretton Woods institutions? Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. I'll start by giving a bit of maybe context, if you allow, for one or two minutes. I think looking at the title of the session, sometimes I get the impression that we've decided collectively that debt is a dirty word, and, and yet it's my bread and butter now as a CEO of the Development Bank. So I thought I should set the record straight on a few facts. I think fact number one is that it is true that today, as we stand, 52 low- and middle-income countries have, are at risk of debt distress. But we need to look at why, because sometimes there's a certain narrative especially around Africa, that you know, African governments have gone and brought through the euro bonds and now they're just paying the cost of their own decisions. Well, the truth of the matter is not really that. Um, if you look at where Africa, was, where Africa debt was before 2019, it was actually very sustainable. We had one or two few you know, African Greeces, the way Greece is to Europe, we had our own, but generally debt was, the sovereign debt was actually very well managed. The reason why we are where we are today is because the LIBOR cost, you know, as, as, as discussed, has just exploded for no reason related to Africa mismanagement. So we are where we are, and as a development bank, we have to play a role to support our government to continue to make the investments that are needed. Today, we're looking at the investments to meet the SDGs and the investments that are related to climate. Uh, my country is not a polluting country. We contribute 0. 0.0000 something to global emissions, but we're in the top 20 most affected countries from climate change with recently very heavy floods. So even though we've not caused the climate change, today we're paying the bill for the climate change. And I think the discussion that needs to happen is how is the world going to make sure that collectively we have a fair process to pay that bill. And I think right now, to your point, Rachel, this process is not existing. So what can be the role of a development bank in this context? We are able, as a development bank, to borrow, uh, coming back to debt, from DFIs, uh, from other institutions, from markets, off the government balance sheet. So we allow our governments to free up some debt space to become a bridge between the SDGs and the private sector. So it's important because I know many development finance institutions, you know, um, expect the development banks to be collaterals by government, and I think it's wrong. Because we can play a role off the sovereign balance sheet and, and be able to contribute to the SDGs without burdening the capacity of the state. In the, capa in the, in the context of Rwanda, exports is a, big, um, is a big issue because the key constraints to our debt stock is actually our capacity to find dollars to repay the debt. So if you look at our debt to GDP ratio, it's quite low. But if you look at our, ex our exports to, to, to debt, it's very high. And therefore, as a development bank, we focused a lot on trying to grow the export base to be, to be able to empower the SMEs at the micro level to actually do businesses where they can export and earn foreign currency. Uh, so export is a big piece to create the debt space. Secondly, is also to see how can we create innovative finance. I think in the past, many development banks were a little bit lazy with their balance sheets. So they would get money from various DFIs and not even try to blend it. So it was a dollar for a dollar, which is kind of the lazy way of doing banking. I'm sure if my colleague here from Cameroon had to lend a dollar for a dollar from capital, her shareholders would be horrified. But somehow in the public development banks, we found it acceptable. I don't know why. So it's time for us to now look at how do we use this concession of funds better? And this is where, to your question about the Bretton Woods institutions, we've worked closely with them to say for every dollar of IDA that we get, can we leverage money from the local private sector? 
We talk a lot about innovative financing at the global level, and sometimes we forget that our economies are often 60 to 80% financed locally. And therefore, the number one source of innovative finance is actually local finance. How do we unlock the potential of pension funds? How do we unlock the potential of our sovereign funds to actually contribute to our SDGs objectives and our climate change objectives? And this is one of the key roles of development banks, is actually to unlock the local private sector um, financing that is available for our markets. So without being long, I think we definitely have a role to play. Uh, the bank that I lead has half a billion dollar portfolio with the Bretton Woods institution called the World Bank. So we work with them directly to see how can we use IDA to leverage funding internally and how can we make sure that our private sector and our financial sector can be incentivized to contribute to the SDGs. So we do on lending to commercial banks, we do on lending to MFIs, we do on lending to SACOs, and uh, we also do direct lending, of course, in areas that are currently un underserved by the financial sector. But more importantly, I think, as we think about the way forward, is how can development banks unlock locally available capital? Thank you. Thank you so much. So I don't want to be selfish and be the only one asking you questions in as much as I could go on. I also want to give our audience um, a chance to ask us questions. Uh, so if there are any questions uh, from the floor, if you could start making your way to the microphones. Um, and before you ask your question, if you could say your name and the organization um, that you're representing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, wonderful panel. Um, my, my comment was mainly on public finance and uh, international public finance. Uh, I feel that at, at, at some point it's easy to discount the possibility or the potential of increasing it. Though we have had an experience quite recently, it was a sad experience of course, but it showed how the international community and uh, governments were really able to mobilize funds in a very short uh, time and huge amounts of funds to counter the pandemic as uh, it was uh, mentioned previously uh, by uh, Madam the moderator. So I think the, there is still a possibility to increase uh, development uh, uh, finance uh, um, to tackle um, climate change, but also uh, other development needs. And uh, maybe there is political attention that the, or political uh, uh, leadership that might be lacking at some at some point or maybe in some specific sectors but we have seen for example with regards to the reform of the MDBs there was a strong call for reforming the MDBs coming out of the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh but also this message we've seen it also within the G20 and we're seeing it next week within the the, the new financial uh, pact that is being convened by uh, the French presidency so there are messages that are reverberating and I think there is still possibility to increase uh, uh, um, international public finance and development finance. Thank you. Thank you. Next, on my right. Good morning and thank you for a wonderful panel. My name is Anit Mukherjee and I lead the Global Economics Program at, the, uh, OR, at ORF America. And I have a question for each of the panelists, but I'll restrict myself to two. Um, first question to uh, Madam Campeta, because what you just said is very fresh in my mind right now, and it's very intriguing that you mentioned the, question, the, the issue of blending, and that's kind of the big issue in climate finance now. Um, just one, the question is, you said that NDBs can, the national development banks can un unlock private, private capital within the countries. How much has it got to do with good governance in general? both in financial sector and, uh, and the, the economy in, 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 its, in itself. Uh, is Rwanda an, an, ex, um, an exception in the African continent? Um, the second question to Rajiv, well, thank you for Sri Lanka. I used to live there and we, we had a chat about it. So how do you think this Sri Lankan experience would change the outlook for countries which are distressed in fiscally to have the first port of call to bilateral donors rather than going to multilaterals as the first port of call. Thank you. 
Thank you. Let me take one more and then uh, the panelists can respond. So um, we... I'm Varuna from uh, government of Sri Lanka. Uh, a very good uh, forum to elaborate the financing options for development as well as debt restructuring. Uh, my question is uh, for the, anyone from the panel. So we uh, saw uh, the uh, development uh, scenario and the welfare state. Uh, the welfare state versus a new way of entrepreneurship uh, to promote individuals and, 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 and population at large to survive themselves uh, without the government support. So we have experienced a lot of uh, uh, ODA and uh, debts have been uh, diverted for welfare, not in investment in commercialized uh, entrepreneurship that will bring societies up. Uh, it is the same in my country, in Sri Lanka, as well as in many other countries. So with the new SDG uh, arrangement, so we are thinking about the sustainability in the, in the big picture. So the sustainable consumption and production can bring into this equation. How do you think that can be uh, mobilized to some sort of innovative financing? That's my question. Thank you so much. So to the panelists, um, if uh, Kampeta and Rajiv could answer the question specifically directed to them. And then for the remaining questions, um, whoever feels led to respond, please respond or share your reflections. So let me start with uh, Kampeta, please. Thank you. Thank, you very Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just make two quick comments. The first one is um, on the first comment on the capacity to leverage more global public finance at the moment. I think we were all here when the Silicon Valley Bank um, got into trouble. It took three days for the federal government to find billions of dollars to support the depositors. I didn't see an international conference, a G20 meeting, you know, a special declaration, but somehow the money was found. Same thing with COVID. We saw the contribution all of a sudden to several institutions, international institutions, and it didn't take very many meetings to rally, you know, this kind of very large, we're talking about billions of dollars. So I don't think the money is really the problem. I think the problem is the political will. I was participating in the spring meetings recently, last month in April in DC, and I think for the first time, the environmentalists and the finance people are speaking the same language. For many years, we're on different sides of the board. So what is missing? What is missing is just political will. I don't think what is missing is the money, or what is missing is how to spend the money. If you look at the panel, we all have very similar ideas about how the money can be spent. Um, and if you go to any panel on climate finance, you will find the same ideas reverberating because I think there's a general consensus technically about how this money should be spent. So where we are now is, will there be a political will to do something or will there not? When we come to good governance and national development banks, um, I would say national development banks are necessary evil. We, we are needed, sometimes we misbehave and, and this is in every country. I don't think Rwanda is an exception. My own institution has gone through turmoils and turbulences and now we're doing very well. So it's sometimes it's, you know, it's like having your own child. They, they, they go through teenage, but you don't throw them out. You know, you, you keep with them. <laughs> I, I want to say though, that most national development banks that survived the nineties, and we are many, um, actually doing well in Africa. So if you look at the list of national development banks that survived, whether you're looking at Nigeria, the Bank of Industry, Trade Development Bank, the National Bank of Botswana, the one of Rwanda, the National Development Bank of Uganda, you'll be surprised to see that even in a context where governance is a challenge, actually these development banks are doing really well. So I think the stigma or the bad reputation that we, you know, we earned in the 90s is kind of stuck to our backs. But if you look at their financials, we have very many very strong uh, and powerful national development banks. They're actually very well run. So I would say generally, the lessons have been learned. And as we talk about the SDRs that are about to be hopefully be released, 
I think the African Development Bank has made a very strong case to request you know, the Bretton Woods institutions to release some of these SDRs to AFDB so that can be passed on to the National Development Bank actually you know, as a very concrete way of supporting their development and the role that they can play, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Campes. Reggie? In response to the question on bilateral and multilateral, at the time we were in a crisis, we didn't have much choice. So we had to reach out to the fastest possible source of funding. It was our neighbors who, were, who helped us out, the bilateral lenders. Um, but in the long term, in a country like, for example, Sri Lanka and possibly a lot of the other African countries also, when you don't have your accountability systems in place, governance systems at the top level, and we are all building, strengthening our systems, and strengthening our democratic institutions. But when it is not at optimum level, there is room for leadership to misuse funding. And bilateral uh, funding and bilateral loans sometimes are negotiated at a different level, sometimes are not, and conditions are not forced out. Now, for example, the IMF, what took time with the IMF is they had certain demands and conditions that we had to meet. In a, in a, in a situation as such as Sri Lanka, the multilateral agencies that way would bring in certain reform. And for example, IMF has now demanded that we need a strong anti-corruption bill or anti-corruption act. And that is now in the process of being passed. If not for the IMF uh, pressure, this anti-corruption bill would not have seen the light of day. <laughs> so whilst bilateral support is welcome and we are very uh, appreciative of our neighbors in, 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 the, uh, in South, in, uh, South Asia for supporting us in the time of crisis. In the long term, I, I would personally feel that still the support of the multilateral, multilateral agencies are necessary to ensure that governance systems are strengthened and maintained and, and that corruption and things like that are, are overcome. So, so then that, that is my response. So long term, uh, sustainable finance and uh, sustainability finance and uh, climate finance both need uh, long term capital. And the long term capital exists for like uh, life insurance, pension funds, but uh, the, you know, the money is there, but how to use that? That's a uh, you know, big uh, problem and it will take time to uh, develop a good scheme. Uh, and the multilateralism, uh, so if you look at the G7 uh, leaders communique and the other documents, and then also the G20 argument, the, it sounds like uh, all the you know, solutions will be provided by the multilateral development banks, but uh, it's impossible, obviously. And actually, multilateral development banks are very, you know, group of very capable people. I, I joined the uh, ADB uh, three years ago. Before that, I was a professor. So. So it's new, and then I learned, oh, they are really capable people, but they are very slow because they are lending money to government. So it's like a treaty, and then, then lots of planning. So they are very, very careful and very slow. And then the money will go to the government or the, uh, the National Development Bank. So the capability, the, uh, those things, uh, cap uh, uh, capacity building, must be uh, uh, provided. So actually, the, the most things that the multilateral development banks are doing is uh, capacity building. So increasing capital of the uh, MDBs means more and more, and more capacity building and more you know, capable people are needed. So uh, this is what's happening. So not uh, uh, just a uh, uh, competitor said, it, it's not a matter of money, but uh, the very strong uh, will or political will and also uh, you know, human capacity. Thanks. Uh, just taking on this point from Sonobe san, I think uh, one of the reforms which is very much uh, needed is to expand the capital of MDBs, the multilateral development banks, three times or five times, and it can be done uh, with much lesser amount of resources because, you know, you uh, spread the money. Uh, and, of course, it goes uh, without saying that expansion of their capital should go hand in hand with the their ability to support capacity building, which is very critical part of uh, MDBs, the, what they do to developing countries. Thank you.
step please. in because I think we've had a lot of policy and development bans. Um, the, one of the questions that were asked about um, the possibility of having more public funds, and I just want to add to what my colleague said. We have to realize that most African countries, if I, if I use the case of African countries, um, the governments have been used to having money from multilateral um, or DFIs, okay? Because the public has a culture which does not um, have them going to the banks. We don't have banked, a banked population. You have less than 15% of any population in Africa being banked. So there's a problem of financial inclusion. If you don't have financial inclusion, you will not have deposits in the banks. If you don't have deposits in the banks, the banks cannot, the governments cannot rely on banks for financing. So they were highly leveraged to I would say foreign donors because they did not have a local source. So what is important is the restructuring of our our, our debt um, taking environment because as my colleague said, debt is not bad. We need debt to be able to grow the economies. We need debt to be able to grow businesses. So it's not a bad thing. It's just how do we do it? So we have to change the culture in our population by working really hard on financial inclusion. And most of the time you will need partnerships. You will see that telco companies don't have the same problem. They have 90% of the population having a, mo a mobile by a phone. So you have to partner as a bank with these fintechs and um, telcos to be able to increase the level of financial inclusion. There's money in our economies, but the money is in the informal sector. We still have informal ways of savings where in Cameroon, people do with ethnic groups, we have a saving scheme, but the money is just circulated amongst ourselves and not put in the bank. So we have to have incentives to bring that money into the former sector so that we have diverse source of having funds. And our governments at the same time have to work on corruption. We have to work on redistribution of wealth. We have to better manage our fiscal policy. Um, we have to not only do what is instructed by IMF or the World Bank, but we ourselves have to put regulations in place to structure how we collect funds, how we use it, and how we can have a very clear tool that lets everybody know the money in the system is being used for X, Y, Z um, objective. I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Gwen. If I can just take one more question then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question on the point that was mentioned earlier on attracting institutional investors, like local institutional investors. What kind of options do you see there um, for that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Any one of you, because of time? Thank you very much. Um, so the Development Bank of Rwanda, uh, the institution that I lead, is planning to issue a sustainability-linked bond on the local market. And this is one of the instruments that hopefully will help us capture some of the institutional investors and make sure that we invest these funds into key SDG, um, key performance indicators linked to the SDGs. So from where we sit, we think um, instruments like SLBs can be very helpful to that effect. Hopefully, you know, people like Gwen can invest in. Exactly. <laughs> I was just going to add that EcoBank raised two years ago $350 million for a sustainable development bond. And this is to enable us to have those investors who are interested um, to participate in developmental, environmental initiatives. So I think we have started, it's slow, um, but some commercial banks in Africa are, are coming up with sustainable development frameworks to see how to re leverage into that area that so far remains untapped. Thank you. So money is not the issue, it's there both domestically, the resources we can tap from the unbanked, also globally, we know the resources are there. It's the mechanisms and the interventions that we need to work on and deploy. And with that, I'd like to thank you all, as well as my panelists, Rajiv, Tetsushi, Gwen, Kampeta, and Nagesh. Thank you so much. <laughs>